Thanks, and welcome to the Wednesday, April 12th, 2023 meeting of the Redmond Planning Commission. Call this meeting to order. And we'll begin with a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Woodyear. Present. Commissioner Aparna. Present. Commissioner Van Nyman. Present. Commissioner Sheffrin. Present. Commissioner Dueva Camina. Present. Vice Chair Weston. Present. And I am Chair Sherry Nichols. Uh, I look for a motion to approve the agenda for tonight. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the agenda is approved. And we also have the March 22nd, 2023 meeting summary. I look for a uh, motion to approve that meeting summary. So moved. Second. Second. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, now we will move on to election of officers. Uh, you saw in the memo uh, it's time for our annual election of officers. Um, so I will open the floor for nominations for chair. I'd like to nominate Sherry Nichols for chair. Okay. And I accept. Are there any other nominations for chair? Then I will close the nominations <laughs> before I change my mind, yes. All in favor of Sherry Nichols as chair? Aye. 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 And I will serve as chair for another year. Then I will open the floor for nominations for vice chair. I would like to nominate Susan Weston. Okay. Any other nominations for vice chair? Then I will close the floor for nominations. And all in favor of Susan Weston as vice chair? Aye. 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 And thank you for serving as vice chair for another year. Um, just a reminder, somebody will have to, to step into one of these two seats next year because I term out in a year. <laughs> just a reminder, gentle reminder. Okay. This is the point in the meeting where we offer an opportunity for public comment on any item that is not subject of a public hearing. And we do have one person signed up for uh, public comment, David Morton. Thank you. May I begin? You may begin. Good evening, members of the Redmond Planning Commission. My name is David Morton, and I wish to discuss the Washington State Growth Management Act and how it impacts activities within Redmond's critical aquifer recharge areas or CARAs. The Growth Management Act or GMA is a comprehensive framework designed to encourage smart and sustainable uh, growth in our state. It sets out guidelines for cities and counties to follow when planning for growth, including the protection of critical aquifer recharge areas. CARAs are defined as areas with a critical recharging effect on aquifers used for potable water. Jurisdictions must protect groundwater by minimizing activities and conditions that pose contamination risks and must ensure that contamination prevention plans and best man management practices are followed. According to the Growth Management Act, certain activities are prohibited within CARAs because they could poison drinking water aquifers and contaminate the groundwater under the recharge areas. These include automobile repair, solid waste transfer and recycling, hazardous waste treatment and storage, and mining and extraction operations. These activities pose a significant risk to Redmond's groundwater resources and their prohibition is essential to protecting Redmond's water supply. Automobile repair shops can generate waste materials like oil, brake fluid, solvents, fuels, and heavy metals, which can easily leach into the soil and contaminate the groundwater. Solid waste transfer and recycling facilities can generate noise and air pollution and can generate leachate, which can contaminate groundwater. Hazardous waste treatment and storage facilities can release toxic chemicals that can persist in the, in the environment for decades or even centuries. And mining and extraction operations can destroy natural habitats and pollute groundwater. 
In addition to these specific examples, the GMA prohibits, prohibits any activity within critical areas that could result in a significant adverse impact on the environment. This includes activities that could harm endangered species, degrade water quality, or destroy critical habitat. In conclusion, it's essential to recognize the importance of the GMA and its role in protecting our state's critical aquifer recharge areas. The prohibition of certain activities within CARS is crucial to maintaining the health and well-being of our environment and community. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and I urge you to continue to uphold the GMA's guidelines when making decisions regarding growth and development in Redmond. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, nobody else has signed up, so we will move on. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, I did want to uh, recognize staff who are present with us tonight. Uh, we have Glenn Coyle, Ian Lefcourt, Alaric Bean, and Chris Wyatt, and we appreciate them extending their work day to support us tonight. Uh, now we'll move on to Redmond 2050 Human Services Policies Draft 1 Introduction, and I'll turn it over to uh, Ian Lefcourt. I think. There he is. There we go. Such a change presenting from home, my goodness. Hello, <laughs> my name is Ian, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the senior planner helping guide this through the uh, comprehensive plan update. And I'm joined by uh, our senior planner in the human services team, Alaric. And Alaric and uh, Brooke and Tiza and Amber have been developing these materials, helping guide these policies so that we can get the most um, programmatic efficiencies that represent the values of our community. So I'm gonna go through the PowerPoint real quick at kind of a high project management level. And then we have Alaric as our subject matter expert for any specific questions. And we'll also be bringing another touch point to the April 26th planning commission meeting. So whatever heavy topics um, that required more nuanced research we'll be able to take care of tonight and then uh, research and bring back full responses to you at that next meeting. So with that said, The human services element is moving forward as part of the phase two of the Redmond 2050 comprehensive plan update. As you can see, it does in fact feed into a functional and strategic plan because there are many budgeting implications that come from the direction provided by this element. The Washington State Growth Management Act does not require a human services element as part of a jurisdiction's comprehensive plan. As such, the inclusion of a human services element is more a reflection of community values. Sometimes there is a, there's, there's overlap. There's sometimes intersections between human services and other planning efforts, land use, housing, even things like utilities in some cases. And so broadly, the human services element update focuses on putting the more programmatic policies into this element, whereas more of the uh, regulatory and um, rigid policies have been moved into other elements. So for example, in compliance with new state legislation, the policy about ensuring that there's appropriate zoning capacity to do things like meet uh, permanent supportive housing, we located that in the housing element. The policy drivers directed the update of these policy changes. And luckily the human services team just did a needs assessment and strategic plan in the last year. The long range planning team also did a human services existing condition report a little while before that. 
And of course, we have the general Redmond 2050 themes and the housing action plan that was completed a few years ago. All of these pieces help identify the uh, areas of opportunity, the potential solutions, and of course, areas of strength. The high level policy consideration of topics is, well, Redmond's human services team is doing darn good. It's a regional leader. So really the emphasis is on expanding those services, creating more access to those services, improving the equity, and helping foster that strong quilt framework of community. This is one of the few elements where there's an expansion of policies. As we uh, have tried to convey throughout this process, we've been trying to make the comprehensive plan more abridged, more high level, and as such more accessible. But the human services element only had seven policies to begin with. So currently the draft has around 20. We're simplifying and consolidating different pieces, however, there's a further emphasis on equity. There's more, um, I would say, precision in the description of the collaboration and partnerships. And related to that, how they interact with the investments and resources. And then finally, there's just a much more um, highlighted emphasis on the services towards members of our community suffering from homelessness. As I mentioned at the start, we'll have Human uh, Services Manager Brooke Brockingham at the 26th Planning Commission, and we'll uh, go over any comments that come up, and I'll try and deliver that in a uh, comments matrix. But other than that, we're here to answer questions. Thanks, Ian. Commissioners, do you have any questions from the... Uh uh, Commissioner Parna. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. I just had a question. I don't know um, whether this would pertain to the access and equity section or whether it would be in the collaboration section. But um, the access piece, for me, I, I take... Um, I look at the community court system and the services provided during the community court service at the Redmond Library as a great example of where, how human services can reach everybody in an accessible place, same time, every week, um, accessible by public transport, everything is in one place. Um, something like that would be nice to be codified as a policy so that we ensure that such things are available in community centers slash shared facilities. Um, I think that's a model we should move towards. And I've talked about this in terms of other community services as well, where we don't have a single use space, but that's that space is vibrant with a lot of different community services, you know, from library to schools to, so um, I don't know where that would come, but it would be nice to see that as a policy, I, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other comments, questions from commissioners? I have a very nitpicky kind of question, which is on uh, policy uh, HS7, I think it is, let me find it here, uh, which the, the new wording says, utilize available federal funds, such as CDBG funds, in support of affordable housing, human services, and other needed community projects. Um, I would say, do we have to limit it to federal funds? <laughs> it's kind of a nitpicky question, but could it just be federal and other funds or federal and other government funds? Or <laughs> I mean, Got most it. of the funds right now come from the federal government, but. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a little, little bit of a discussion about um, 
the specificity of that. So I, I look yeah. forward to bringing that up to the team. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you went from a more specific to a more general, and I'm saying, can we go a little more general? <laughs> so, like I say, it's a little nitpicky, but uh, in general, I was very pleased with the with the new language in in these policies. Does anybody have any more questions for Ian or Alaric? I, I have a question. This is a question for clarification. I'm looking at page two under the Human Services Element Policy. You should move your mic. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, I wasn't talking. Do I need to repeat myself? Page okay. two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the first row where we have the language communities to ensure all people can attain the resources and opportunities. And I'm anchoring on the words attain, can attain resources and opportunities. And my question is, is that an over promise or is that just the, the spirit of what this framework is meant to achieve? Because when, when, when I hear all people, it, it, that seems like a, a, a very large promise. And is that real? Is that you guys are the experienced people here? Um, I think if you read from the beginning of that policy, it's prioritize services and access to opportunity for to ensure that. I mean, I, I think it is a, a big ask, but I don't know that is the. How, how do we feel about that language? Yeah. Uh, which I am inter interpreting it as a, a, a as a huge promise. Uh, that I wonder whether or not the city of Redmond is prepared to back up on. Yeah. yeah. Are we really going to ensure that all people can attain the resources and opportunities to improve quality of life and address past inequities? Commissioner West. So I'm wondering if it makes sense to um, use access instead of attain, because to have the like to have the services available is different than actually being able to to, to attain use of, yeah. 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 Attain. Except we've already used different. access in the first beginning of that and that's a, policy. And that's a, right. an overall yeah. comment that I have is just really not making sure that we don't prescribe into a framework a, a promise that we are not set up to achieve. Yep. I, I tend to agree. If we're not prepared to implement it, then don't make it a policy. The thing, like, I think using the word, maybe not access to opportunities, if it was just provide services and opportunities, might, I, I then you could use access later. But access like really is the language from um, IDEA, like where you're talking about disabilities and being able to um, still participate. Um, and I'm not sure, that that language is so tied to the disability laws, I'm not sure that maybe it makes sense. So. But it, 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 there's a spirit there of making sure that um, pe populations aren't cut off from the would, opportunities in Redmond. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it's trying to go beyond just not cut off, that we're actually prioritizing um, historically underserved communities so that they can you know, uh, have the opportunities to improve the quality of life and address past inequity. But, um, and my observation is the language that I see in this page does not reflect the spirit that you guys have clarified. So my ask would be that we be a little bit more pragmatic. Um, Ian and Alaric, do you have any feedback on our discussion there? For the policy framework itself, sometimes they are a little bit aspirational, but it's also worth noting that Commissioner Woodyear's perspective is also true that as a trend, we've been trying to avoid prescriptive policies that are overly specific. Um, so I think we can we can work with this to make it more pragmatic and a little bit more clear that um, it'll be more about the city doing the best it's, that it can rather than obtain, obtaining such an absolute outcome. Commissioner Nueva Camino. Um, thank you, Chair Nichols. Um, going back to the word on accessibility, while it has been used around uh, talking about community members with different abilities, um, it's very much used in BIPOC circles, making sure that we have access to resources. Because a lot of times there'll be plenty of resources, but we don't have access to them. Hmm. So 
I don't, I don't know if we should say, okay, no to access when it is a word that we use in our communities. Okay. Any more questions or comments for uh, Ian or Alaric? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again on uh, April 26th, I think it was. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Now we'll go on to Ribbon 2050 Annexation and Regional Planning Policies Draft 1 Introduction. And Odra is on vacation, so Glenn is going to do this for us. Good evening. Um, tonight I'm going to speak on the um, annexation and regional planning uh, policies, the first draft. And um, as Chair Nichols noted, uh, I'm Glenn Coyle, Senior Planner, Long Range Planning. Um, Odra Cardenas would normally be doing this presentation, but um, she is not here today, so I will be doing that in her stead. Um, so I'll try my best to kind of go through the presentation. Um, and if there's some very specific questions, uh, we will just note that um, and have that answered at a future study session. Um, as noted uh, previously, as you just saw in the human services, a very similar process. Uh, as, as folks um, may recall, we have broken down the different elements we update in uh, to different phases, and of course, by the different sections. Uh, sections and elements are kind of interchangeable term, but really it's just the housing element, uh, parks. Um, but for this particular topic tonight, we are talking about annexation and regional planning. Again, this is kind of a reminder of our general Redmond 2050 process of how we've been uh, reviewing and updating um, our policies. Um, there are parts uh, of some of our policies that uh, have more of a community engagement. Um, annexation might be more on the technical side. Uh, so as you see, some of the stuff about questionnaires and things like that. Um, we have a little bit more abbreviated process for that in that regard, even though it is this information is publicly available, but um, aren't really topics that um, <clears throat> garner much controversy or public interest. Um, this just kind of talks about um, our internal processes of how we come to the draft policies, and then there'll be multiple iterations, study sessions, uh, eventually a public hearing, and then um, planning commission's recommendation that will go to council which um, at this point will be next year. Um, and, this is, and this goes for, again, all policies as we talk about this over the next few months, but uh, things to think about as we talk about our draft policies. Uh, do they support our city's vision and goals? Do they align with our Redmond 2050 themes? And are we on the right track on our policy updates? So with all that uh, said, the annexation and regional planning element includes policies that identify ways that the city of Redmond coordinates planning with neighboring jurisdictions and uh, regional bodies. It also guides how the city should annex territory that is beyond its city limits. And it should be noted that the city of Redmond has annexed most of its potential annexation areas. Um, and that's important to note, um, as, as we noted, uh, that there wasn't really much change in this, um, in this update because there really aren't much lands um, to be annexed, uh, which, which we'll get into a little bit more detail. So um, this is a great slide that uh, Odra had put together. 
uh, just noting the growth of Redmond from 1912 to present. And um, I'll just kind of go through this a little bit, uh, very, very briefly. Uh, the city of Redmond, uh, as folks may recall, was um, a modern settlement, was in the 1890s. And the town itself uh, was incorporated in 1912. Um, in Washington State, uh, when, a, when a community has a certain population, they can apply to be incorporated. And um, there are things, services, tax, and ability that go with that. In Redmond's case, when it incorporated in 1912, it was for two purposes. Um, the first was uh, to be able to tax saloons and drinking establishments. Uh, Redmond at the time uh, was mostly a log in town and um, had a lot of saloons. Um, also at the time, uh, the city of Redmond, or town, or village of Redmond at the time was all wooden structures and there was um, water supply issues. So another reason that was incorporated was actually to establish our uh, water system. Uh, so those were the, really the two driving variables in order to A, provide water system, have a place um, to do that, and um, tax and authority. Um, subsequently, um, Redmond really did not grow for about 50 years, at least in terms of city limits, but it was really in the 50s and then into the 60s where um, the population had grown and annexation uh, occurred. Uh, in the 50s, annexation really um, was driven by just need for additional like public lands or it's just property owners looking to get within, say, the water system, generally the water system, um, or some city services. In the 60s and beyond, uh, really the, most of the growth was driven by um, developments, suburban type developments that wanted to also join in on the city services. So that's where you see a lot of the growth there um, until the present. So potential annexation areas. So these were established through the Growth Management Act um, so we have an urban growth boundary, and then within that, and then there's a city limit. So this is kind of the difference between our um, urban growth boundary and our current city limits, is these orange areas. So you can see that um, generally there are about three or four parcels kind of east and west of Redmond uh, that haven't been incorporated. And then uh, the English Hill neighborhood um, north of Education Hill is probably our largest kind of potential annexation area. Um, so as we reviewed this um, section, uh, some of the policy drivers we had looked at was just, was there any changes in state laws? Um, and then any changes to the amount nature of its potential annexation area? Uh, generally speaking, there were not any changes in those regard. So what is new? Um, we reduced some of the policies that we, we found really didn't apply that maybe were, um, were there in, in the 1990s or the early 2000s, but just the way the city has grown and the growth management, uh, we found some of those policies were um, not needed any longer. So generally, we just consolidated and simplified our language. Um, and we also had a policy for orphan roads. Um, don't want to get into that, but uh, uh, but there is some uh, policy language uh, at the county level that um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we talked about, and then also um, pre-annexation agreements, and that's related again to um, utility services. So uh, processes, as I noted, um, uh, short term, um, we'll be looking for any questions um, that we can either answer tonight or at the next study session. Um, and then we're also going to be taking this topic and, and also the human services topic to our community advisory committee um, tomorrow. So um, we'll see if they have any questions on that. But otherwise, we would just be going through the regular Redmond 2050 process, some study sessions, et cetera, et cetera, um, over the, the rest of this year. So that is all I have. Is any questions, comments? Commissioner Parna. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I, I would like to know more about the English Hill part. Um, I know some of it is developed already. Uh, is, is, it, is it something that would help the city build out density? Um, is it something that we can zone for, I don't know, affordable housing? Is there some kind of significant advantage to what that land 
that annexed fees can do for us other than taxes and stuff, right? Um, I, I don't know if there are any plans for that area. I think it's built out fairly quite a bit or so. Yeah. And it's newish to Yeah. So it is lower density. Um, I would say we can come back with a little bit more detailed response, but I, I will note, uh, generally speaking, it is the city's policy that the property owners will initiate an annexation. Um, I see. So the city won't pursue annexation unless um, a majority, and there, there's like a legal requirement of property owners um, wishing to annex into the city. Okay. Um, so at that point, if that process was initiated, then we would um, start looking at how services could be provided or um, change the zone in to accommodate um, the city zone in versus its current zone in, which is, I think, more like a lower density residential. Right. Um, so from what I'm understanding, right now they haven't come to us saying, hey, we want to be part of the city. We are just, in case they do, we have our policies in place, is that yes, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And yes, we, we have not heard any particular interest. I mean, occasionally we, we do hear from property owners, English Hill and other places that are the more question, oh, is the city gonna be annexing in or are, you know, are we part of, are we gonna be part of Woodenville or Redmond or something like that? So we, we do get occasional questions, but um, we, we haven't heard any like movement um, to actually do so. And we won't solicit this question. Excuse me? We, we won't, won't solicit. solicit this question. We won't go and ask them this question. No, the, it is current city policy not, not to. Okay. And yeah. Thanks. Commissioner Woodier. I'm just, curi I'm just curious. How, if the property owners were to request annexation and go through the process, do we have a sense of how this would contribute to our, our housing requirements between now and 2050? Is it a significant, um, does it significantly help us make up our deficit? We would probably have to analyze that later because it would, be, it would come down to uh, zoning. Um, there aren't that many properties there and it's noted that it is low density. So if it was to be utilized for those kind of purposes, uh, we would have to rezone uh, those areas. And that would also be part of the discussion of incorporation and of course, extending city services to that, right. which would be, a very, you know, very generally we have impact fees that n new development uh, pays for the extension of services. So that, that would be part of the understanding of the annexation that, um, and that would probably be also negotiated with the city and the property owners as part of that annexation. So, so it's, it's kind of hard to determine until um, we could actually Get a better sense of that, but. Yeah, I mean, they're on the order of 100 or so houses in English Hill, so I mean, it's not a, not a significant number of houses in terms of. In general, our city policy right now is to focus on the lands with, within the yeah. current city limits, so. And uh, growth providing. Growth targets, et cetera, based on that on premise. Providing city services out to English Hill would not be cheap. Commissioner Weston. So as a follow-up to that, I'm, should there be a policy that um, there's some evaluation of the cost to the city for providing the services? Or is that, yeah, it's in, which one in is here. that? Well, like ensure that the newly, A14, ensure that the newly annexed territory accepts its equitable share of the city's bonded indebtedness. Uh, for newly annexed areas require developers to construct or fund public facilities to serve the development and require owners to pay, you know, so I mean it's uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah. A13 I think is more about new, new development, so that wouldn't help protect the city really if there was any, like if there are existing structures mm -hmm. and they're not being redeveloped, they're just suddenly becoming part of Redmond. That doesn't really capture it. So I didn't, I didn't know if there was just a missing piece where it's like, it has to be a good deal for Redmond to, to take. Yeah, I think Leah required it. We have to do those kind of analysis before. Um, but you don't before. feel that's at a policy level? I would, I would have to check on that. As I said, I'm not as familiar with the policies. But, right. But again, when the annexation process triggered, it, it leads to all these legal requirements and analysis that needs to be done. So. Okay. 
it wouldn't just be, here's a petition, great, we're annexed into the city. It, it would be probably a multi-year process from yeah. initiation to actually incorporation. And is that laid out in the GMA, or where, where is that? Like, at what level? Is it I would have to check. County? Yeah, this is it's state law. But I, state I law, uh, county would probably have some regulations on that. Um, but the, yeah, there is there is state law on how annexation processes work. Okay. I have a question about uh, how are these? I mean, you know, we have a set of four little blocks there that are. How are those uh, assigned to Redmond? The one, the kind of orphan kind of looking. Yeah. Parcels. Like why is English so, Hill assigned to Redmond, not Woodenville, so for that, example? Yeah, it's a Redmond address, but so that's... So those, there was probably more unincorporated land when the growth, um, yeah. the urban growth boundary was devised. Um, uh -huh. How that was, was back in the 1990s, and I believe there was a lot of conversations about how those were devised, who they were assigned to. Um, I, you know, as an anecdote, I, I recall looking at um, one, a comp plan from the 1990s, and it showed all of North Sammamish, as part of Redmond's yeah. urban growth area, but over time that got reassigned and incorporated into Sammamish. So I don't know the exact conversations of how the boundaries were devised, but sure. uh, generally speaking, it probably related to geography. There has to be some contiguity, to, you know, uh, that word. Um, and then also some of the water services at a certain point at, um, on English Hill, as someone noted, um, it becomes the Woodenville water, water systems. District, right. And so that, that would also be a challenge for yeah. the city of Redmond because our, our policy is also for utilities for the city to provide uh, water services to, within its city. So also having a different water uh, system serving like a part of a different, you know, a part of the city would be a little tricky too. So um, that, that's kind of where some probably the, the boundaries were devised back in the 90s. Okay. Mailing address is not really necessarily at all relevant because I grew up in an area where people lived in one state and had a mailing address in another state. <laughs> Just for clarity, it's, this is all south of 124th or does it include the segment that's north of 124th? If we're talking about English Hill, that is north of 124th. Yeah. I believe everything south, south of 124th. is also un unincorporated, right? Uh, Don't have the best map here. It's, I believe. It's just a curiosity. Yeah, I believe everything up to 124. It, it does kind of zigzag around yeah, the Sammamish Valley. Yeah, there's some zigzagging stuff going on. Yeah. So is English Hill, is that, is that the Lake, is that, what school district is that? Is that North Lake Washington or is that no. North Shore? It's North Shore. So it sounds like potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So, but so, so pragmatically speaking, if there was an annex annexation request, it'd probably be re reassigned to to Woodenville, given. No, not necessarily. No, this so area is specifically assigned to Redmond. That's why yeah. it, it's um, there's a term specifically called the potential annexation area. So even though they're in different school districts and different water systems, we already have two school districts in Redmond. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Again, this this would why it would be a bit of a challenge. Um, to incorporate those areas. But English Hill was at some point assigned to Redmond's potential annexation area versus another community's potential right. annexation area. Commissioner Aparna. The, the, the little little dots on the side yeah. are really bothering me. <laughs> um, I don't know why I'm You want to complete. It's just like, okay, why were they left out? But um, I, Because I'm guessing there are very few parcels, maybe one or two parcels or something. Is it some, uh, so who's providing, especially the Kirkland border side, right? So is Kirkland providing the services or are they just one blob of unincorporated county? I believe that is a blob of unincorporated county. It, it's actually just a couple of properties kind of on a steep ravine. Uh -huh. um, and I can't speak to the full history. We, we can research that, but my understanding yeah. is that those property owners did not want to incorporate the, into Redmond when some of those other parts yeah, in that area. Some of Rose the Hill other parts in there were recently incorporated, uh -huh. like in the last 10 or 15 years. So what do they do for water then? 
they arrange. They have septic on that road, but uh, some of, yeah, these have septic. Yeah, a lot of them used to have septic, and it's only getting changed over. Um, Is it wells but, on that side? On that, I don't know. We do have some maps of properties that are still on wells and septics, um, but um, some are and some aren't. I, I can't speak to every specific property unless I look at the map, but yeah, there there are, and I know that that is part of the reason why um, some of those Rose uh, Hill na neighborhoods have incorporated into the city was to extend, help extend um, services, water and wastewater services. Yeah, in particular to get some of them off of septic eventually. And it's also required, um, that's one also our policy is that when um, it's incorporated into a city, the, the services have to be extended. So if there's like right. septics and everything, and that'd be all part of the agreement, like for property owners, if they were incorporate that they would have to um, at some point um, it connect to the, the city system, system okay. or municipal system. So. Yeah, I don't see the advantage of that. They're getting all the services right there almost, right? Yeah, I mean, but yeah, they can they hold out and to, put a little flag connect. there and we're they're yeah. done. I they have know. to, well, it's expensive to pay to connect up. Yes, exactly. So uh -huh. at this point, it is going to be not very advantageous to that item. Yeah. It still looks odd. It, it's very expensive to pay to extend water and sewer to run the lines, it's, it's expensive. I grew up out in the country. <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> and septic, you know, has its issues and not all properties can do septic. You had something, Commissioner West. Yeah, I just had a, um, so other than the water and the taxing the saloons, um, what services exactly do people receive? Like, what's the advantage to them of joining Redmond? Um, the corporate is, again, it'd be water municipal services. It could be, say, police services, um, political representation. Um, it could be addition of sidewalks, other things like that. Um, Are there changes in the building codes? If it would. It would have to. It would. They would switch from the county's unincorporated King County's code zoning, et cetera, to the city's standards. Okay. So it would be a much more, you know, a city standard as opposed to a rural county standard. So, like the roads, uh, how they're built, design, sidewalks, streetlights. There, there are a lot of little variables. Crosswalks, think things like that. Okay. We have to meet what the city's, a particular community's standards are versus uh, the county's. If you're, if you're a developer developing undeveloped land, there's a huge advantage because you can uh, develop more densely. Right. Because you, if you have septic, there's a limit to how right. densely you can develop. Whereas if you can connect up to wastewater sewage, yeah. then you can develop more houses. That makes sense. And then one further question. So, um, like most of these little ones, if they joined in, they would become part of, like the little one over here would become part of Rose Hill probably. Is that right? But then English Hill, where it's so big, would it become its own neighborhood? Be its own. Like its own neighborhood? Like a new neighborhood within Redmond or would it um, join possibly, in somewhere else? Possibly. I mean, all that planning would have to be done. Part of it. Yes. I, okay. But... Um, just because of the geography and um, how that would be, it probably would be its own sub area, but I can't speak to that because yeah. it's kind of really theoretical at this point. But the topography does change a little bit there, so it probably would be kind of its own sub area. Great. Thank you. And I should also note that um, we are noting these questions and we can provide a little bit more clarification um, at, the, at the next um, study session for this. Any more questions about the annexation regional planning policies? Yeah. Um, I, I will note that the other question that we uh, often get asked is why don't we annex um, Redmond Ridge, um, which it's outside the urban growth boundary. <laughs> yeah, I, I could actually speak to that. Yeah. I did a little bit of research on that. Um, that is... It's out beyond... Yeah, it, it, there was a lot of controversy around that one. Um, 
It is urban plan development, and it was actually, um, that was area was supposed to be maintained as rural. Uh, the property owners, those were big login properties, and they had proposed, before the Growth Management Act went into effect, they had proposed um, this uh, master plan development in that area, um, Redmond Ridge and Trilogy. Um, but then when the Growth Management Act went into effect, it kind of precluded that. But there was a court cases that went through for at least almost 10 years, maybe longer. Um, but basically, the property owners were vested, um, and it was ruled that they were vested and they could uh, develop uh, this planned uh, master plan development. But it was never included as part of Redmond's uh, urban growth area or its annexation area. So it's kind of its own island. That being said, we, the city of Redmond does provide fire service um, through uh, Fire District 34. And we also provide uh, water and uh, wastewater services. Um, but the way that's structured is that they specifically pay for the service that, that the city provides to them. And that's also written in our policies in the annexation and also our utilities and capital facilities policies that, um, that they pay for their, the service that the city provides. But it, won't, it doesn't have the potential to be uh, included as municipal of city of Redmond. I'm sorry. I don't understand why they would not they would not be eligible to be included as as an annex to the city of Redmond. Uh, because it is not included as its potential annexation area, which is a is a legal designation at the county level. Um, so it would have to change at both the county and the city level, and probably even have get permission at the state level, level. to just. It's a little. Yeah, you'll see the maps. There's a little island of urban growth area on Redmond Ridge, and that's where the planned development um, is. Um. Yeah. <laughs> but they are there, there's a lot of uh, great articles, and even when I was in, um, in grad school, that was one of the things we were, we were studying. It, it was still in the courts at the time, how, how that was developed. So um, we can see if we can find some inf inf existing information about how that was developed. But um, it, it is, you know, interesting um, story if you're into kind of those things. <laughs> so they have an agreement for because of the uh, master plan thing, from what I understand, right? Is, does that have an expiration date on it, or is it like, that I, 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 I do not know. Um, I know they have a special designation through the county as a master plan development, so I don't know what the stipulations were. There most likely was a development agreement, right. things like that. I have not seen or read those kind of uh, things, but my, my understanding the way the development agreement was is that pretty much the development that's there is pretty much limited. Yeah, that, like, I think it's pretty much built yeah, it, now, and that's like it. The development agreement said you can only build this amount of houses and so much land has to be set aside for some critical areas, right. things like that. Um, so I don't know if there is a potential to redevelop you know, in 50 years or 100. I, I don't know that level of detail. And I'm not even sure how I could find the development agreement. It's probably somewhere in the county. Some time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've been trying to find it myself, it's not, actually. It's not in the city of Redmond. and is not eligible to be part of the city of Redmond. We do get that question asked a lot, so I, yeah. <laughs> I've been researching it a lot myself yeah. just to be able to answer. A lot of people who, are who live in Redmond Ridge and are surprised that they aren't part of the city of Redmond. Okay, anything else for Glenn on this? Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to staff and commissioner updates. Glenn, what you got for us? All right. Uh, the main thing to highlight is uh, next week is the annual uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have four topics um, that looks like we're, we're pretty much come together. Uh, we're going to have uh, Jan Harrison, who's our new diversity, equity, inclusion uh, manager. Uh, she'll be here um, just kind of for a chat, introduce um, the work she's doing and just some of the, you know, issues and concerns um, for the city of Redmond and, you know, opportunity to kind of get to know each other and share kind of some of your thoughts on that, just more, a little bit more open-ended. Um, 
And hopefully folks saw there was an email about a public space evaluation. It's kind of a little bit of homework exercise, but I will hope spend a little bit of time thinking about it or um, physically doing it. Um, the details are in the email, but basically, and you don't have to follow the, there was like a little worksheet, but the idea is to find um, like a public space that you like in Redmond that has the potential um, for improvement or you know for growth or something like that and it ties into this 10 15 minute you know those concepts of you know 10 15 minute neighborhood um, I think you know there's a couple of different terms out there so uh, the idea is you know if you can do the exercise and then come back and kind of talk about it and then have you know group discussion on that um, we did that with the community advisory committee and it seemed to w went over really well and led to some good discussion so you know, we hope the same for that and something a little bit different. Um, we're also going to have um, um, the, the safe walk in um, TOD neighborhoods that um, um, one of our colleagues, um, Mary uh, LaHaro, is working on. So she'll give a quick presentation on that, on kind of um, accessibility around TOD study that they're working on. Um, and then lastly, we're also going to be going over uh, the PC norms, which is just kind of the kind of rules and procedures, um, review that. And we'll also spend a few minutes uh, just talking about the work plan ahead for the rest of 2025, which is basically Redmond 2050 stuff. But so we'll only spend a few minutes on that, but we'll, we'll just go over that a little bit more detail um, as needed. So um, that's pretty much it for the workshop. And then, there'll, again, there'll be another meeting on... Um, 26, 27. Uh, so there's, there's a weekly meeting for the rest of this month, so I, I would just note that. There you go. And that's all I have. Any commissioner updates? Okay. Then I will look for a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we are adjourned.